Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. In 1992, someone gave me an audio cassette of Chuck Missler teaching Bible prophecy. I was mesmerized by this teaching, and by the end of the lesson, he had me hanging on every word. Often using his formidable business background to explain difficult Bible passages, Chuck communicated more clearly than any Bible teacher I had ever heard. A few months later, my wife and I met Chuck and his wife Nan in person, and as he did with many others, he challenged me to get out of my secular world and into ministry. So I put together a Bible conference, the first Stealing the Mind conference in my hometown of Vail, Colorado. I had Chuck speak, and he brought the house down. He spoke at every Stealing conference after that for some 15 years. You'll love this montage of clips from Chuck Missler's 15 years of speaking at Stealing the Mind. The Best of Chuck Missler by Chuck Missler. It's great being back here. I don't know if you've heard, you know, being at a conference like this, you probably don't get the news. But you know what's going on in Iraq? Yeah, they're shutting down all the Kmarts and converting them to targets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Someone gave that to us. As they, I had to work that in. One of our modern myths is the nebular hypothesis. If you've taken a course in astronomy or you pick up almost any astronomy book and talks about the origin of the solar system, we have these theories about how the planets were pulled out of the sun and so forth. This is a myth of origins, a little different than the biological stuff that several speakers have dealt with already today. But uh, it, uh, going back, the, the, most people attribute the origin of the so-called nebular hypothesis to Immanuel Kant in 1755. And just to paraphrase it simply, he's, he suggested that some four billion years ago, the sun had ejected a tail, like, or a filament of material, sort of like a comet, that cooled and collected and thus formed the planets, and on it goes. Now that is attributed to Immanuel Kant, but that's a misnomer. It actually didn't come from him. 21 years earlier, it was formulated by Immanuel Swedenborg. And, and it was done in Latin. Uh, in 1734, and uh, he was a mining engineer that had a wide range of interests, and he claimed to have psychic powers. He claimed this theory was uh, developed from seances with men on Jupiter, Saturn, and places more distant. And I don't make any editorial comment on that topic. I'm just reporting it to you. Um, some 20 years earlier, we have records that he apparently uh, had an opportunity to spend some time with Edmund Halley, who, of course, is famous for his study of comets at you know, Cambridge. And, and uh, so he picked up some of the ideas that he used in his theory, apparently, uh, from uh, Edmund Halley. But uh, what's interesting is Pierre Simon uh, Laplace, who is the famous mathematician, was a friend of his. And he lent his endorsement to Kant's theory, but without checking the mathematical validations he was capable of providing, but didn't bother. And uh, so thus, because Kant proposed it and Laplace confirmed it. It became scientific dictum back in the you know, uh, end of the 17th century, uh, end of the 18th century. And uh, it is still commonly presumed as a result of schooling and textbooks to this day. So one of the things I'm here to do is not sell you something, is get, to raise your caution threshold uh, subsequent writers have developed views to try to amend this very, very flimsy conjecture. But the difficulties mount. It turns out that our sun contains about 99.86% of all the mass of the solar system. So most of the mass of our solar system, of course, is in the sun. All right? But there's something very strange. There's a thing called angular momentum that is also conserved in closed, in closed systems. And angular momentum is conserved. Let me give you an example. When you see a skater and they bring their, their weight in, it spins fa they spin faster, they're conserving angular momentum. Some of it's dissipated, of course, in the friction on the ice, but it's not much. So the, the idea of angular momentum is a form of energy to conserve. It's interesting. The sun contains almost 100% of the mass, yet it contains only 1.9%, call it 2%, of the angular momentum of the, of the solar system. That, leads, that, means, that get, creates some real problems. That means our nine planets, our nine known planets, contain about 98.1% of all the angular momentum. How on earth, 
How did that energy get injected? It couldn't have come from the sun. And this was known, by the way, in the time of Laplace a century ago. And there is no explanation that would support a solar origin of our planets. They've tried all kinds of crazy stories. And uh, James Jeans, uh, uh, the famous mathematician, also pointed out that the outer planets are larger than the inner ones. That raises other problems. How on earth did that develop? Jupiter is, is 5,700 times as massive as Mercury and almost 3,000 times as massive as Mars and so forth. The difference in size is substantial, but also the bigger ones are out there further. And that's backwards if you try to make a model. There's all kinds of difficulties. But there's other enigmas. Something that's very, very strange, if you look at the spin rates of our nine planets, we discover they're in pairs. There are three pairs of them that are within 3% of each other. Earth and Mars have about the same spin rates, Jupiter and Saturn, Neptune and Uranus. That raises, that's just evidence to investigate, to find out what's going on here. Why is that possible? Another observation is Earth and Mars have virtually identical spin axes. Both Earth about 23 and a half degrees. Why? Why these similarities among certain of these things? And uh, see, from the angular momentum and the orbital calculations, it would seem that these three pairs of planets may have been brought here from elsewhere. In fact, you can even indulge in the calculations to speculate on how big and what kind of an orbit the carrier would have been. Our moon is an example. The moon could not have happened this close to the sun. It had to happen way out there, join the Earth, and brought in here. So those are just conclusions from the mathematics that are observable. Another question is, why does Mars have 93% of its craters on one hemisphere? Well, as we map Mars with the current stuff, it's very interesting that only 7% are in the other hemisphere. What it seems to suggest is that 80% of the craters on Mars occurred within a single half hour. Can you imagine? So these are just observations. Let's talk a little bit more about the planet Mars fourth major planet from the sun. It was named after the Roman god of war. We use the term today. We speak of martial arts. Why do we call it martial arts? It's named after tradition of Mars being the god of war. Most of the early civilizations on the planet Earth worshipped in terror the planet Mars. Why? Unless you have an astronomy interest of some kind, Tonight, if we had a clear sky and I asked you to go out there and your life depended on pointing out Mars, I think most of it would flunk. Unless you just happen to have an ephemeris or subscribe to astronomy today or happen to, you know, know it's our angle and what have you. So, uh, but and yet the ancient civilizations were terrified of Mars. Why is that? Um, it is the Baal of the Old Testament. 2 Kings 23.5 and a dozen other places. So Why? What is there about the planet Mars that would strike fear into most civilizations on the planet Earth? When we read Joshua chapter 10, encounter this strange issue of the long day of Joshua. And I think most of us, probably, as sophisticated 20th century scientist trained people, sort of wince at that because we can't visualize the Earth coming to a stop for a day but we don't understand it doesn't have to come to a stop for the day to be longer. But the point is we, many Christians are sort of embarrassed by Joshua 10. They don't need to be. Let's take a look at it. We're talking about the Battle of Beth Horon. The kings that were adverse to Joshua had confederated under a king who called himself Adonai Zedek, that is the Lord of Righteousness, or the king of Jerusalem. Well, he, of course, in this battle gets, and his, his forces get defeated with stones of fire from heaven. And by the way, the marksmanship was really fascinating because these stones, apparently meteorites, were put in orbit maybe thousands and thousands of years earlier. But it was put in orbit so precise that they only hit the enemy that didn't hit Israel. That's marksmanship, gang. Yeah. But this is the battle. Some, the days were not long enough for some of Joshua's battles. So Joshua pleaded with the Lord to give him a longer day so he could finish the mop-up action. So the son was commanded to stand still, or be thou silent, technically, to give them 
more time to complete the route. So the sun and the moon apparently were extended, so to speak, for an, ex an entire day. The kings hide in a cave and ultimately are dealt with, and of course the southern strategy uh, is completed and the rest, is, the rest of the book is really mop, uh, mop up. This is a pivotal story. Well, what, what is this business about the sun standing still? Well, if you do some background in this area, you'll discover that the ancient calendars, over a dozen of them uh, that uh, have been identified and that more, uh, uh, are based on 360-day years. And we could spend a whole hour getting into the very colorful background here. All the ancient calendars apparently changed about 701 B.C. And the Romans, of course, added four and a quarter days, essentially. It's not quite that simple, but that's basically it. Um, Hezekiah in Israel resorted to a rather strange formula to adjust the calendar. He added a month seven times in a 19-year cycle. A very weird formula. If you take 19 years, there's seven different times that they add a month to the year to make up the difference between the solar and the sidereal year. And uh, what's it, 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 But in 701 BC, something caused the calendars to change. And uh, that's a mystery we'll come to in a minute. I mentioned that Mars is, was worshipped by the ancient cultures. A group of scientists, one of them teaches celestial mechanics at Harvard. Another was involved with Boeing in the space program. A guy by name Steinhauer, Pat, and Hatch wrote a book, and they built a computer model that reconciles not just seven different catastrophes in the Bible by the observation that Earth and Mars was apparently originally on resonant orbits. Now, those of you that know about tuning forks, you know how you have two tuning forks at the same frequency. You can, across the room, hit one, and the other one will sympathetically vibrate to it. That, that's a resonant, what we call resonance in engineering. Well, as we've learned about orbital mechanics, orbits are also interactive and can achieve resonance. And they, they, they noticed that the, the, these noticed that the, the uh, events in the memory of man seem to include catastrophes on a frequency of about every 108 years, or a multiple of 54 in any case. And uh, so this little model will account for at least seven of the major catastrophes on, uh, that are recorded in the Bible. And these energy transfers that are involved in near passbys, and I'll come to that in a minute, were stabilized in 71 BC. And uh, let's just take a look at this. The Earth, obviously, you know, revolves around the sun. How many knew that? Do you know that goes long before Ptolemy? Do you know that the ancient civilizations in Samaria and Babylon knew that? It was Ptolemy that messed it all up and got, you know, the, the idea that the sun goes around the earth. So many of the things that Copernicus had to fight were actually beliefs that were introduced in the middle. The ancients were not as ignorant as some people would like us to believe. But anyway, the point is Mar Earth is on an orbit of 360 days, Mars on 720. And uh, that, would be, that would put them in resonance, except it creates a problem. They would have a near pass-by, typically uh, every 108 years in the spring, March 20th, 21st, uh, the spring-type near pass-by, it would come, uh, Mars would come from the inside just after they passed the sun, and uh, the Earth orbit would gain a little energy, Mars would lose a little energy. And by the way, that point on a celestial sphere is called the first point in Aries, which is the ancient word for Mars. And most astronomers don't know why it's called that, that, uh, that why it has that peculiar label. They attribute it to mythology, but they have no idea why it's really called that. The other near pass by would occur in the fall, October 25th. In this case, Mars would come from the outside after aphelion, that's after the furthest distance from the sun. It would pass behind the Earth. In this case, the Earth would lose a little energy, and Mars would pick it up. So they would be playing this toe dance where the, the orbits would gain or lose a little energy, but it was in seven, about 701 BC that they stabilize, and uh, where the Earth, they no longer have that pass by because of the changes. Uh, Earth picks up five and a quarter days, Mars uh, you know, loses um, uh, 13 and, uh, days. And uh, they are where they are today. Now, what's interesting, um, uh, this is a theory. They're building elaborate computer models, and they really fit. That doesn't make them true. But we get a corroborative piece of evidence from the strangest place you can imagine. 
How many have ever heard of Gulliver's Travels? It's a children's story, right? Not really. Um, uh, the, um, let's back up a little bit. The early telescope technology, it was in 1610 that Galileo had the first telescope, very crude one, but he was able with it to find the four moons of Jupiter and he saw Saturn's rings. That's 1610. In 1781, Herschel, very famous astronomer, discovered Uranus. Obviously, telephone, uh, excuse me, telescope technology is improving, of course, as the years go by. 1787, Herschel finds the two moons of Uranus. 1789, the two more moons of Uranus. 1846, Lavier with a Neptune and one of its moons. And now here's an interesting thing. It's in 1877 that Ace of Hall, using a brand new telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory, this makes a astronomical history by discovering that Mars has two moons. Before 1877, the astronomical world didn't know that. And he, Ace of Hall, discovered the two moons of Mars, and it was, they were named Dimas and Phobos. Now, uh, Dimas has a period about 30 hours and 18 minutes, which is, makes it almost on a synchronous orbit around Mars. Phobos is 7 hours and 39 minutes, and it's the only element that's going backwards. It goes eastward. And the reason so, these things are so hard to see, they're not very big. Phobos is only 8 miles in diameter, and it has a reflectivity, an albedo of only uh, about 3%. In other words, it's almost black. So it takes a very good telescope to find it, and that's what Asaph Hall did. He says, okay, check, what's this got to do with anything? Well, here's the point. There's a guy by the name of Jonathan Swift who was an Irish satirist. And he wrote a series of stories that he called Gulliver's Travels that were intended to be political commentary. We treat them as children's stories because we've lost the political context that they were intended for. But he was poking fun at the British and the, Lo and the London uh, authorities. But he wrote these, and most of us know the story of the Lilliputians, where Gulliver visits the island with the little tiny people. But most of us have, have uh, not... Um, uh, read the third voyage of Gulliver to Laputa. And if you read Laputa, it turns out that in Laputa, Gulliver visits this island uh, which, in which the story details that the, the astronomers in Laputa brag that they know about the two moons of Mars and the astronomers in London don't know anything about them. And the text mentions the size of these things the revolutions and the orbits of the two moons of Mars to an accuracy of about 20%. Not precisely, but pretty close. The, the mystery is how on earth... This, by the way, see, Jonathan Swift published Gulliver's Travels 151 years before S.F. Hall discovered uh, the two moons of Mars. How do you explain this? Lucky guess? Some people, no, some, some serious authors say, because uh, uh, what Swift was doing was just embellishing his parody, this political parody. And he just folded that in to make it to be colorful. Did he just accidentally happen to know, the, happen to guess these right? No. What most people believe that have studied this is that Swift apparently had access to some folklore that he assumed was probably just folklore, but he drew upon it to embellish his, his story. What he probably didn't realize is the materials he was drawing from were eyewitness accounts of the near pass by of Mars. Because in order for the naked eye to see the two moons of Mars, Mars would have to be about 70,000 miles from the planet Earth. So this, strangely, is a corroborative piece of evidence, not conclusive, but very provocative, that it, it endorses the computer models that Patton, Steinhauer, and Hatch have developed. So let's talk about the long day. You know, there were about a third of a million men at the Battle of Beth Horn in Joshua 10. On October 25th of 1404 BC, Mars was on a polar pass at about 70,000 miles. It appeared to rise from the horizon that night at 50 times the size of the moon. Can you imagine how they'd feel? There were severe earthquakes and land tides. A polar shift of about five degrees would cause the day to be lengthened. Just change the precession of the Earth. Is that why Mars and Earth have the same tilt? That's kind of interesting. Meteors would follow two to three hours later at about 30,000 miles an hour. And, uh, and this event is included in a lot of other ancient legends and folklore, folklore not just the biblical record. The, uh, in fact, we're indebted to Vilikow Emmanuel Velikowski, who discovered the legend in China of the long night, which I think is kind of interesting. I can't 
when you're starting to read your Bible, there's more to it than just a cosmology here. You notice when you read the book of Joshua, realize Yehoshua is a variant of Yeshua, okay? And uh, uh, we see Joshua presented as a military commander that's dispossessing the usurpers. He has a seven-year campaign against seven of the original ten nations. The Torah is ignored at Jericho. The Sabbath is ignored. They don't rest the seventh day. They, write, go, they march around seven times as many. The Levites, who were not supposed to go to war, lead the procession. The Torah is totally ignored at Jericho. There are seven trumpet events that occurred. And by the way, they're preceded in, with silence in heaven for half an hour, as a quote from a, a Revelation 8, verse 1. The enemies are defeated under a leader in Jerusalem, excuse me, confederated uh, uh, by a leader uh, of the leader of Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. He's ultimately defeated with the hailstones of fire from heaven and signs of the sun and the moon. And you may be recognizing, and then the kings who are defeated hide in caves until they're dealt with. And you may recognize that all of this is a, par is a foreshadowing of the entire structure of the book of Revelation. Let's talk a little bit, first of all, about re-emergent diseases. And we'll also talk about deliberate diseases. Let's talk a little bit about global health. Let's talk about the dark side. You know, about 50 years ago, Scientists predicted the end of death and suffering from infectious diseases. That was pretty bold. But in the last 25 years, we've discovered that there's a reemergence and a geographical spread of well-known diseases, including tuberculosis, malaria, cholera, and many, many of these are in more virulent and drug-resistant forms than before. Diseases that were thought to be obsolete now have come once again become a global threat. And many of these are rougher because they've gotten immune to the antibiotics that we've been using for lots of different reasons. I won't go into the background there. We've got more, too much to cover here. And we go through each one of these as diseases, and obviously at the head of the list is cancer, but we won't. There's something else that I came across in researching this that you might find interesting. Scientists have discovered that bacteria, we're talking about single-celled organisms. Did you know that they take role before attacking you? These are one-celled animals, right? They do what the scientists call quorum sensing. E. coli, salmonella, vibra cholera, and 30 others take role. They won't attack until they've determined there's enough of them to have a chance of winning. That make you uncomfortable? It gave me the creeps. Whenever <laughs> it's, well, it, it's like that passage in, in Luke, you know, a king before he goes against assesses his strength, right, and so forth. Some facts, this, now I have to share this with you. The number of physicians in the U.S. has been estimated at 700,000. The accidental deaths caused by physicians per year are about 120,000. So the accidental deaths per physician, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is 0 0.171. Okay, that's great. The number of gun owners in the United States is 80 million. The accidental gun deaths per year is about 1,500. It's probably 1,501 lately, right? Well, the accidental deaths per gun owner is 0 .0000188, which means, in a, this is about the FBI, that doctors are about 9,000 times as dangerous <laughs> as gun owners. Now, I could put the statistics up on lawyers, but if I did, it might shock you, and you might go seek medical attention. Right? <laughs> I had to throw this in here. This has been circulating on the Internet for years. As it's obviously a gag. It's interesting when you see that correspondence, though, that they quarrel with the logic. They don't quarrel with the accuracy of the data, but we'll move on anyway. <laughs> I'd like to sensitize you to the difference between the technology of conveyance and the technology of content. They're two different technologies altogether. Techno it, it's, it's like the media versus the manuscript. You follow me? There's a technology to making a book. You got paper, you got binding, you got cover, you know, you're with me? That's got nothing to do with what's written in the book. Two different technologies. Did the ink write the book? Of course not. What we're seeing is the result. There's another science involved, and it's the frontier science, the master of all the sciences. That's the information sciences. If we take just one mo uh, 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 a molecule, let's take hemoglobin. It's in your blood. It consists of 574 amino acids. Here's a list of the 20 and how much you need. You need 36 of the glycine, 68 of the alanine, and so forth. That's how, so you've got now, you're, making a, you're not making 374 from, bin, from an alphabet of 2. You're making 574 from an alphabet of 20. 
That's a little more complicated in the mathematics. But switching theory will give you a chance to do, 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 do that out. Remember, the one I had before was 10. Remember that the, these were uh, 10 with 104 zeros? If you take the hemoglobin molecule, it turns out these 574 elements from alphabet 20 turns out to represent 10 with 650 zeros from a, 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 are possible. If you have but a few of those out of place, it's called hemoglobinopathy. It's fatal. Okay? Now, Borel's law, I remind you, if you have 10 to the minus 50, it's, it's absurd. Here you have 10 to the minus 650. It is really absurd. How absurd is it? Let me get another way. What's your probability of winning the Idaho State Lottery? Whatever it is, it is. What is the probability of winning two days in a row? Pretty unlikely. Three days in a row. How about 90 days in a row? Is that likely at all? That is really absurd, okay? So, so we can go through all the different ways to measure these numbers, but that's basically... Let's, let's keep moving here. Let me just talk about this mechanically. Let's make a model of the DNA, and we're going to represent your DNA by a pair of monofilament fishing lines, okay? 125 miles long. Now, what I want you to do with these pair of, of fishing lines is I want you to roll it up and put it inside a basketball, okay, without tangling. And I want you to do that in such a way that you can take it out, unzip it, copy it, and put it back without tangling. Unzipped, copied, and restored on spools back in the basketball at three times the speed of an airplane propeller without tangling. Could you design such a system? That's going on in your body as we speak. The most commonly read library in the world is you. Your cells are reading that DNA to do its work all the time. Millions. Like this. All by accident. Come on. <laughs> Which came first? This is, the, this is the big problem. Which came first, DNA or the proteins? You can't have proteins without DNA, and you can't have DNA without protein. It's a chicken and egg thing, but it's down at the basics. They both had to be designed skillfully together. Anybody that's been in a design team, if you have a design team over here designing the hardware of a computer, and you got over here the guys doing the software, they better be talking to each other. You follow me? The idea that either one is random is the height of absurdity, and any guy that's been in a design group recognizes the, in, that we, are, we see confronted all the time intelligent design. But when does tampering with an embryo become murder? That's a big issue. That's a big issue. Is it acceptable to clone a baby to save a child's life? It's been done. But uh, when does human life begin? You know, when everybody, whenever this comes up, I'm always fond of point, asking the question, when did John the Baptist begin his ministry? When he was nine inches long and weighed a pound and a half. He jumped for joy and was spirit-filled in his mother's womb. That should end it for the, for the biblical guy. Now, how will clones impact our society? They're coming. The scientists tell us it's just a matter of time before they'll clone people. What, how is that going to work in our society? Can a clone be saved? There's going to be interesting issues. Is the Antichrist going to be a clone? Can a clone become saved and so forth? And what are the prophetic implications? Those are all issues. The first question is, are they real? Now, the problem in this area, if you research it at all, is there's so much information that's uncorroborated, unreliable, deliberate hoaxes. There's also substantial budgets, apparently, for disinformation in this area, both pro and con. On the other hand, when you strip away all of that, you discover there's much, in fact, too much to ignore, that is substantiated, involving multiple competent witnesses. They have been plotted on radar, and we'll talk a little bit about their characteristics. They're, you also discover many books have been written that seem to indicate these things have been around uh, in the Stone Age period, on the murals, in some of the caves, in Egyptian hieroglyphics. The journals of the troops of Alexander the Great record these things, and the log of Christopher Columbus record such things. In the modern era, most of us, I think, begin to record what we call the modern era of UFOs from the Roswell incident. About in the early period of July 1947, something landed 
near Roswell, New Mexico. Now, the Army investigated, issued a press release that hit 30 of the major national papers in the United States, which indicated that some kind of unidentified flying object had landed near Roswell. The legends that emerged from those are, are all kinds. There's all kinds of strange stories, typically involving uh, not only a UFO, but four occupants, four, uh, three dead, one still alive, and so on. Within hours, the Army seals off the area and takes whatever was there to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and within a few hours from 400 miles away from Fort Worth, they issue a contrary press release saying that it was just a weather balloon. For 50 years, strange stories, even more and more absurd cover stories, get released by the military. Several of the men involved that became generals before they died and before they died admitted it was a cover-up. So what we, we don't know what happened at Roswell. To this day, several presidents and a number of congressmen have been unable to crack the security that wraps around Roswell. All we do know for sure is there, for some reason, is a big cover-up. I believe that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's my challenge. If you accept that challenge, you flunk the course. You need to challenge this. But I do believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the gospel period. Now, how do you challenge that statement? First, find out what the Bible really says about the end times. Secondly, find out what's going on. That's why you come to conferences like this. Now, lest I've gotten too spooky here, don't forget who our warfare is with. Our warfare is not with Bill and Hillary Clinton or the liberal establishment or fill in the blank. Those are all symptoms of the problem. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The, Paul is dealing here in Ephesians chapter 6 with ranks of angels. With ranks of angels. I personally believe that the, this is just conjecture, but I personally am drawing to the view that the, the, the demons in the New Testament were the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that drowned in the flood and subsequently. Don't confuse demons in the New Testament idiom with as the only ones you're at war with. Angels are far more formidable and far more frightening. Now, what is, Chuck, that sounds great. What do I do about that? What do I do if I wake up in the middle of the night and there's a couple of creatures at the foot of my bed that want to take me away? I have to tell you, our, I got your attention, okay. <laughs> On our return, of, we, th this is obviously a precy of a, a video and some things we call the return of the Nephilim. And on that tape, I make the remark that a Christian cannot be abducted. I got a call from one of the top executives at Universal Studios who got upset with me. He says, Chuck, I heard your broadcast, because the tapes were on the radio too. So I heard your thing on the radio. I happen to be expert in this area because I was the executive producer of some major uh, projects. The guy that called me and said it was Tracy Torme. He was the executive producer of Fire in the Sky and some other projects. He says, Chuck, I, have, I, I loved your briefing right up until the point where you said a Christian can't be abducted. I had to track you down and call you because you're wrong. I happen to know you're wrong. I was startled, first of all, by the call. He says, Chuck, you need to check out the Andreessen Affair, which subsequent to that phone call, I did. And the Andreessen Affair is a situation where a, a woman, 20-year history in a spirit-filled congregation as a spirit-filled believer, was abducted, apparently, uh, by uh, some occupants of a UFO. But I read the reports carefully, and if you read the reports carefully, it says that sh she accepted their invitation to come along. And I realize the problem that he has, but I also don't think my statement's incorrect. I don't believe a Christian can be unwillingly abducted. Now, what is your remedy if indeed you find yourself in some kind of bizarre encounter? What do you do? Well, your, your refuge is not in Genesis 6, it's in Ephesians 6. I don't have the time to develop this, but I want to challenge everyone in this room. When you get home, if you can wait that long, do a serious study of Ephesians chapter 6. Find out what the armor of God is. Paul tells you twice, put on the whole armor of God. Not your favorite pieces, 
the whole armor. Gird yourself with truth. Find out what that means. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Better not be yours. Find out what that means. Have your feet shod with preparation. Now, preparation is what you do before the battle, but you're already in the battle. You're on to enemy turf today. You've got to do your homework. And what is the shield of faith? When a Roman soldier repaired his shield, it had holes in it. When did he repair it? Not during the battle, beforehand. Does your shield of faith have holes in it? Do your homework. If there's holes in your faith, don't wait for them to be challenged. Identify them and get the answers you need right now. Do your homework. And understand your helmet of salvation. Owning it ain't enough. You need to wear it. You can tell the guys that aren't wearing their helmet by the bandages. Do you have doubts about your eternal security? Because if you do, you've got it, your, your, your face in the wrong place. It's his faithfulness that I'm hanging on, not mine. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Let me tell you something about the Roman swords. They required two things. They required wit, they, the, the, the conventional wisdom of its day was long swords, sharp on one side. The Romans developed a short 24 inch pachyra, double edged. With it, they conquered the world. But there's two things you've got to know about a machira. It took special training and practice. You had to know how to close and how to use it. Same thing with the sword that's in your lap. It takes training. You need to know how to use it. And of course, your heavy artillery is prayer. And I encourage every one of you to take that seriously. It's so convenient. You and I have a hotline directly to the throne room of the universe. We need to use it. People come up to you, Chuck, what can we do for your ministry? Let me tell you the number one thing we do for our ministry, and let's pray for us. Because you can tell from the weird stuff we're getting into, we're asking for it. We're out there. <laughs> Now, let me, I'll just wrap it up here. Honestly, Bill, I think Bill's having cardiac arrest because I'm wrinkling too long. <laughs> I want you to visualize as a three-dimensional diagram. This curved line through is, I'm going to call time. You and I are in linear time, but God is outside time. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Back there in the past, we have them. The people of the past, Adam and you name it. We're up here in the present from the throne room of the universe, he obviously can look into time and see the predicament of those in the past, Adam and following. He can also see us right now where we are today. But being outside time, but transcendent of time and space, God himself could enter time. He can actually go back through time in that sense, you see, not to change it, but to fulfill it. And of course, we all know what happened 2,000 years ago. You and I are the beneficiaries of a love story that was written in blood on a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago that settles the conflict that's forthcoming. We've read ahead. We know who, we've read the last chapter. We know who wins. Whether you participate or not is a, is a function entirely of your personal relationship with that victor. Doesn't matter what church you go to, how regularly, that's not the issue. It's your personal relationship with him. Everybody's been asking me about the cane and so forth, so I didn't want to get into it. I promised I'd spend a moment and explain what happened. You know, they wanted a picture for a Christmas card, and you know Nan and Lisa are really into horses. I'm not. I just happen not to be into that sort of thing. But they wanted to pose a picture, so I consented. And I think everything was going well when suddenly it started to buck. And first thing I knew, I was thrown. And uh, that probably would have been all right, too, except my foot got caught in the stirrup. And first thing I was being dragged, my head was banging, until the Walmart manager pulled the plug out of the wall and stopped it. Man, if you believe that story, I suppose you're one of these people that believes airport announcements, too, you know. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to explain, if I may, are these beads. I really wore them to make Bill Perkins nervous. <laughs> you know. And uh, you see, these beads are, um, I call them the beads of Waitangi, and there's a long story that I'll spare you here, but these are uh, a, a series of beads. Now, um, I call these, let's see if I can pull this off here. Um, what we have here is a set of beads that happen to spell out in Morse code Genesis 1-1. Oh, yeah. 
See, there's two dots. That's I, a dash dot. That's N, N, T, H, E, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the question I want to ask you is, how good a scientist are you after Kent Hovind? I thought this is a good follow-up just to start with this. These are what I call the beads of Watangi, and there's a historical reason behind it that I'll spare you. But the real question is, um, what's the chance that this happened by accident? <laughs> if I told you I spilled two buckets, two little... Uh, uh, cups of beads on the floor and picked them up randomly and put them on a piece of string and it ended up in, the, in this exact sequence, how many of you would believe me? Not a Democrat in the bunch. Here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> woo! I'll get letters, I'll get letters, yeah. <laughs> I usually attribute this to the Mari people who, did they know Genesis 1-1 in English? Did they know the Morse code? Or, that's one possibility, or did the sequence occur through random chance? Well, if it did, what's the chance of that? We have 357 beads in a particular sequence there. There are only two choices, black and white. The probability of that being a random choice is 2 raised to the minus 357th power, or putting in decimal terms, it's like 3 with 107 zeros after it. Now, if you know anything about physics, anything over with more than 50 zeros is considered, is defined as absurd or impossible. So, th and this is not 50, this is 107. So this, for this to have happened by accident is absolutely impossible by scientific definitions. And yet, you know, this is just a simple binary string. Your hemoglobin molecule in your blood consists of 574 elements which are chosen from an alphabet, not of two, but of 20. And, uh, you know, the, the 20 uh, you know, acids and so forth. There's this formula for specificity, and to give you the short version here, that's 10 with 650 zeros after it. This is trivial compared to your hemoglobin molecule, which, of course, your, your kids are being taught happened by chance alone. If any one of them is out of place, it's called hemoglobinopathy, and that's fatal. So the impossibility of chance. There's only 10 to the 18 seconds in the history of the universe if you accept the 15 billion year lifetime that some people estimate. There are only 10 to the 66 atoms in, the, in, the, in our entire galaxy. Only 10 to the 80th particles in our galaxy. So probabilities greater than 10 to the 50th, if you will, are, defines absurd. And 650 is, of course, even way beyond that. It's equal, to, it's equal to winning the lottery every day for 90 days in a row. <laughs> Anybody counting on that? That's what your kids are being taught in school. And of course, this is trivial compared to the DNA, which has three out of four error-correcting, self-replicating code. There aren't, there's probably not one engineer in 100 that knows how to design one of those. It all happened by chance. We're talking three billion elements defining the manufacture and arrangement of hundreds of thousands of devices, consisting of unique assemblies selected from over 200 proteins, each involving over 3,000 atoms in three-dimensional configurations all defined from this alphabet of 20 amino acids. The point is, it's obviously absurd. So what is the choices? Did the Mari people really do this by knowing Genesis 1-1 in English and knew Morse code? It happens they could have. The Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840, which protects their religion, which happens to be Christian, by the way. And uh, they could have known the Morse code because Waitangi was 1840, Samuel Morse's code was in 1832. That's all just to confuse the fact. The truth of the matter is I just contrived this to, because I thought this would be instructional and provocative, and so I, there you go. Okay. Now, my staff says we should start to merchandise these as the Christian's answer to the pet rock, you know. <laughs> as we travel, everybody asks me what happened at Roswell. And the, no one knows what happened at Roswell. The military came in and sealed it off, and whatever was there, they shipped and, and, and disappeared into the never-never land of military security. But uh, uh, two presidents and four congressmen have not been able to crack the security of Roswell. The mystery of Roswell is, why is it still classified after 50 years? Okay? Well, um, when audiences always ask, what, Chuck, what really happened at Roswell? I usually tell them, I don't know what happened at Roswell. I do know what happened nine months after Roswell. Al Gore was born. This has been the best of Chuck Missler. To receive a free catalog of all of our Bible study DVDs, CDs, audio tapes, and books, 
information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach, call 800-977-2177 24 hours a day or on the web at compass.org.